great to have you here, Natalie. Well, it's, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. That and was... I will be tight with time. Before. I'm tight with time. I'll do my best. Um, obviously, as Bruce said, this is a shift of topic, kind of, but I think you will see that my presentation connects not only to the other two presentations this morning, but also something that will be discussed tonight uh, at the Australian Institute, Institute of International Affairs, right? And maybe also bring up some of the questions that you discussed yesterday. So my starting point, as I said, seems to be the first fairly offside from what you've been uh, uh, discussing up till now, because it is uh, the fear of Islamic radicalization in Europe. Right? Now, I'm going to start with some definitions. Some of them may already be familiar to you, some may not. Right? Um, there have been, in fact, two types of fears of radicalization that have been particularly uh, influential in recent years in Europe, and they have tended to be conflated. Right? Uh, on the one hand, you have the fear of a purely religious form of radicalization, uh, which has been uh, spreading in Europe, and that's a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam which has been pushed by the Salafi movement, which originated in Egypt, uh, which is an extremist Sunni Muslim movement with a strong sense of Islamic uh, identity and a very strong puritanical strain. Uh, as a whole, it was not associated, in fact, with violent action, but in the 1990s, some members of the Salafi movement did install an ideology of, of violent uh, uh, intervention. Uh, then you have uh, a second fear, which has been influential in Europe, and but also obviously in the West, that of the Islamic anti-Western ideology we are all familiar with since the terrorist attack of 2001, which is known as jihadism or Salafist jihadism, which inspired the formation of an international movement, uh -huh, of course, uh, Al-Qaeda. Okay. So these are the two definitions. The Sufis, in fact, have been conflated in all discussions of radicalization, not only in Europe, in the West as a whole, including in Australia. But this phenomenon of the Sufis being conflated is had particular consequences in Europe for reasons which I will try to outline. Right? So in the 1990s and the first decade of the 21st century, Salafi jihadism uh, motivated the formation of terrorist cells. Right? that were part of the Al-Qaeda network, always simply inspired by its ideology. This is a very complex area of, of terrorism. Studies are not part of this, I know sufficiently, to be able to look at some aspects of it from my perspective as a political theorist. Now, in 2005, after the London and Madrid bombings, there should be an S there, a European Union counter-terrorism strategy was formulated. And it was led by the European Council of Concilium. We've had an introduction for those who have not heard before about the institution of the EU yesterday, so you should be able to have a certain idea of where the Concilium fits in that complex architecture of the European Union. And this strategy has been largely successful in stopping attacks. Right? But, as in all counter terrorist strategies in the West, right, it is clear that it may well have created other problems. For other presentations, I've given links, right? I don't know what's been done in terms of letting you have those presentations, but you can have it, right, with all those links if you want to have more information about it, right? So, what of the situation today? The jihadi uh, ideology, jihadi's ideology is still active in Europe, and it's still generating forms of terrorist action, but large Al-Qaeda action <coughs> led by Al-Qaeda, or connected to Al-Qaeda, have been successfully combated by European anti-terrorist agencies, and terrorism in Europe has evolved. It is in operating now on a more reduced scale, and it is starting to assume new forms. Right? The one that we all heard uh, about not so long ago was the forms of the lone wolf attack, committed by Mohammed Mera, a Muslim French citizen, who in March 2012 in southern France killed seven people, and he just fought on those very, very serious. Now, despite the reduced threat of jihadism on European soil, of course, those lone wolf attacks like Mara are, are, are very, uh, uh, obviously, very challenging and very worrying, right? But in terms of the magnitude of it, it's not a significant threat, right, compared to the kind of attacks that were planned right, uh, in the first decade of the century. 
but reality is still perceived in Europe as a serious concern. And there is one reason for that, and then I will explain that there are other reasons as well. Because of its impact on European nationals outside Europe, as demonstrated by something that's been in the news recently, which is the decision made on January 11th by French President François Hollande to intervene in the north of Mali. So I'll now take a little bit of time just to give you the basic you know, background to this, and then I'll move on to what I consider are the greater implications uh, for Europe. One, the intervention was launched to support the Malian army in its struggles against an organization that became affiliated with Al-Qaeda and its Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb team. Maghreb is of North Africa, uh, above the Sahara, which is of mostly uh, Arabic culture and Muslim religion. Uh, now, I can develop itself, and that history is important, even though I'm not going to uh, explore those implications. From an Algerian terrorist organization called Algerian Salafist Group for Predication and Combat, GSBC. Uh, and the GSBC was itself a splinter group, right? This is the history of all those movements, uh, of GIA, an organization which formed in 1992. When the Algerian uh, military government basically decided to throw democracy out the window and annul the electoral victory of the Islamic Salvation Front, the largest Islamic opposition. And that was backed by the West, by the way, right? So that because it was an Islamic party, Islamic, not Islamist, okay? So not necessarily embracing the ideology of Allah. Jihad up and out the election, which provoked a lot of resentment, and it pushed some people right, into embracing the violent anti-Western uh, jihadist ideology. Uh, uh, now, this organization, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, in the Maghreb, came to the attention of European authorities because of its involvement in a series of kidnappings of European tourists or workers especially aid workers. There are currently nine European hostages held by them, including six French citizens. Uh, the French have been particularly sensitive to the issues, you can see, and you will see why. Because in 2011, a splinter group, yet again, right, formed in sub-Saharan Western Africa. So to put in very blunt term, no longer involving Arabs, but also involving Muslim black Africans. Right? Uh, the movement for oneness and jihad in West Africa, and I won't try to pronounce the acronym, um, which declared a war on France because it is hostile to the interests of Islam. This is exactly what they said, right? Um, we are declaring war on France. Now you have more links here, <coughs> if you want more information once you get the, the, the lecture. Now, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yes? Yes, I think I'm repeating myself here, uh, so you can forget the first point because it was about the connection to the Algerian situation of, of the movement. Uh, but before Al Qaeda became Al Qaeda, no, before the um, the Algerian uh, terrorist movement became the Al Qaeda in Maghreb, right, it had to secure the support of Bin Laden, right? He was the official head, figurehead of of Al Qaeda, right? And they certainly were very keen to gain his support um, uh, because it would give their movement more impact, right? Uh, and Bin Laden himself was quite happy about this because he saw it as a way to secure a base for Al Qaeda from which to mount terrorist attacks against Europe and France, especially, right? And this is at that point that the GSPC became renamed as APQIM Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, right? Now, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb and developed its own modus of error that became much more of a criminal organization, and that is very important. Right? Uh, they've accumulated great resources through such activities as drug trafficking and uh, money, la money laundering, basically, uh, which are then packaged, justified ideology, uh, but then being put at the service of the creation of an Islamic state in sub Saharan uh, Mali, right? and hopefully. Uh, moving on to, to the rest of Sub-Saharan West Africa and incorporating Algeria as well. Right? So let's go on. So with the fall of the Libyan military regime, things have become really serious uh, because the movement has acquired even more sophisticated weapons and extended the territory in controls. And I've just provided a map here, but this is for your information, so I'll go very quickly. So that's France, right? France decided the intervention, but there was a European background to it, right? The day after Hollande's declaration, uh, European Commission President José Manuel Barroso immediately expressed support for the French.
French intervention. And then the EU, EU's foreign policy uh, chief, Catherine Ashton, announced accelerated preparation for something that had been in the planning since December last year, the deployment of the EU military mission to Middle Mali to support it, right? Uh, so the French intervention was just, I suppose, motivated by impatience right, with the slowness of European action, right? But there might be other, also any other reasons. And I hope Bruce will be a little bit lenient with me and get, allow me to get there, right? So at the level of EU member states, support was moderate, right? Which may explain also the slowness, right? There, are the, there is the institutional slowness associated with the EU, which is an incredibly complex organization. But there was also uh, uh, reasons why the support was moderate, right? So, uh, because uh, uh, this school has a German dimension, but I, I will point out that in Germany there's been a new uh, security doctrine which is called the Merkel Doctrine, right? Uh, and I'll put a link uh, for those who are interested in that, uh, which is really, we'll give money, we won't send soldiers, right? And I'll come back to why that is, right? So, Germany said, yes, 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 we'll back up the French, but uh, okay, weapons, no, weapons, right? Logistic support, nothing more. The British, well, they're so caught up in air and uh, matters of the main problems at the moment that they also only offer logistical support. Uh, southern Mediterranean countries like Italy, Spain, who are absolutely caught up in their uh, economic uh, crisis, uh, only offered verbal support, right? Uh, and so did Poland. Uh, but then through NATO, France was able to secure a little bit more support from Denmark and also the United States. Now, the French intervention, regardless of its wisdom or its success, right, has another dimension, and that's the one I want to explore, because I'm not a security expert, right? I'm a political theorist, and a specialist of European politics and European Union politics. Um, and the French intervention, in my perspective, illustrates that where European security, number one, has become even meshed with political developments in North Africa, right? the destabilization of region following the Arab Revolution. And the next speaker will talk about that, I think. I certainly expect she does, because I've left it aside. <laughs> right? But I think something else is happening at a deeper level. Right? These um, developments, right, which, which are linked to the Arab Spring, have been interacting with inner political concerns, which have motivated right, that French intervention. And it's to do with the fears prevalent in public opinion, the fear of refugees, the fear of immigrants, the fear of terrorist attacks, which is, you know, links up to the topic of the third speaker, you know, migration, right? And politicians have become increasingly attentive to these fears. They've been for a while, right? But in the context of the financial crisis and the economic recession that's associated with the financial crisis, it's become even more of an issue, right? So one can explain the limited support right, at the level of other European uh, country states Member States of the EU, right? I want to explain by the need to avoid costs, right? They <coughs> don't want to spend money. The financial crisis in government cut military expenditure drastically, right? But it also illustrates a concern in our countries not to alienate public opinions to the risk of a loss of lives. And it's obviously linked also to the disengagement of European countries from Afghanistan, right? Uh, concern associated with the fragility of governments, right? All governments have become fragile. They, you know, they have difficulty securing electoral support. They have, you know, uh, uh, often the, they are the, the uh, outcome of political alliances. In the case of the Netherlands, not so long ago, um, and so uh, this is linked, obviously, to the financial crisis and the imposition of austerity measures. Right? There is mounting dissatisfaction of European electorals with their political class, right? And as that you know, develops, the political class is very, very concerned not to alienate right, their voters. Now, paradoxically, right, if you look at France, it, it, all these factors are played, but the other way, right? Because uh, the need to secure uh, public, uh, the support of public opinion, right, it's been seen by many as explaining, in fact, the decision made by Francois Hollande to intervene in Mali, right? before the European strategy had been developed, right? Uh, and it is a major reversal for Hollande because he made quite a number of declarations uh, in the course of the electoral campaign, right, before he became uh, president of the French Republic, 
where he expressed the desire to put distance between himself and the African policy pursued by Sarkozy, which I can't go into, but I will put a link there if you're interested as well. And why? It was from uh, last year, August, Hollande's popularity has been in free fall, right? It's been the biggest loss of popularity of the country president, right? Since the, um, the, the, uh, the second uh, presidential method of Jacques Chirac uh, leading to the uh, presidential election of 2005, which saw the extreme right wing uh, uh, come to the fore. But I can't go into the complexities of French politics, but I'm just sort of giving you that as a background. Uh, it was down to 36% in last December, which is catastrophic, right? Well, since he declared a military intervention, guess what? It has recovered, right? And yeah, it's been demonstrated by polls, right? Uh, which took place in the January 11th, January 12th. Now, the, the EAT action, the action, this French action in Africa, has attracted quasi unanimous support within French public opinion. 75%, that's hard. And across the French political spectrum, it's quasi unanimous, okay? Ah, but we can see that there are interesting little you know, exceptions to that, right? So all political parties express support with the exception of the radical left, right? The radical left, which has condemned it as an extension of neo-colonial interference in Africa, because Mali was a French colony until 1960, right? And this neo-colonialism has been criticized for quite a number of uh, years, for those who may be uh, are French speaking, as français -free. Right. Uh, but on the right, right, interestingly enough, the, the right supported it, even the extreme right, except for one figure, <laughs> the maverick ex-leader of the new nationalist extreme right party, the National Front, and that Jean-Marie Le Pen, his daughter, who now leads the party, said, wonderful, it's great, you know, it's against terrorism, okay, all right? Uh, but the father disagreed, now I can't again go into the complexities of French politics. But I want to mention, uh, also, the criticism were made by a very respected figure, not only in France, but internationally, right? Uh, who in the French tradition is both a, a diplomatic figure and a political figure. And that is Dominique Villeta, who formulated very strong criticism uh, in an article uh, uh, that was uh, published in the French press. And he was a, a, a foreign minister, right? And he's most remembered, right, in France, but outside of France especially, because of a declaration made in 2003 in front of the United States, the United Nations, sorry, where he outlines France's opposition to the American declaration of war on Iraq, right? And this French opposition was then supported by Germany. It was a strong French-German alliance against the war in Iraq. It was not supported by the, the, the Polish government, but also substantial within the European because of Chirac's stupid declaration that the Polish should just shut up, which was extremely disrespectful. Um, but this is, you know, this is the background. So let's see what the Vipa actually said about uh, Hollande's decision to intervene in Mali. He made the declaration in which he called the way French policy has become, had become contaminated by what he called a neoconservative virus. Now, he did not use the word American, but that's obviously what he was talking about, right? To be honest, he's a standard French globalist, therefore, by definition, anti-American, okay? <laughs> um, similarly, anti-terrorism, specialists of jihadism, have also been critical. And that's interesting, and I want to develop that point as well. Uh, Anti-terrorism, especially jihadism, have warned of the danger that the French military intervention uh, would, over the long term, not immediately but over the long term, breed more terrorists in France. Right? The danger is that it will encourage young, disgruntled French and European Muslims more widely, I will get to that, uh, to see in the North Mali a holy Muslim land, right? which can attack an infidel European alliance, okay? Um, allow Mali to replace the role played by Afghanistan right, in the imagination of jihadist terrorists. And that's a tough thing to be right? So terrorism specialists, not all of them, but many have argued that the French intervention has a potential of being an acronym, you know, 
additional legitimacy because military intervention feeds the jihadist, jihadist ideology of legitimate holy war, right? Because it treats the whole thing as if it's a war. Uh, this was a major mistake made by the American legal conservative response to the terrorist attacks of 2001, right? Which was to use the language of war, right? As well as the language of civilizational conflict instead of the language of security against criminal activity, right? Which ensured the survival of the jihadist ideology over the future decades, right? Now, this mistake impacted mostly on Europe, right? Uh, of course, on all the parts of the world, right? But in Europe, it was particularly significant, and I'll now try, I have a few more minutes, to present this, uh, which became an area in which Al Qaeda operatives were successful, very successful, in recruiting, or recruiting young terrorists to support their attacks, right? So let's now look at why, uh, why you? The success of the, of the ideology of jihadism in Europe right, raises uh, a lot of questions. It's in, incredibly complex. Right? And it does not only concern terrorist specialists, which is why I am here. I actually need a research project for the Malaysia European EU Centre, which has some people who are involved in terrorist, terrorism studies, but the others are mostly political theorists or political theorists slash sociologists. Right? So those questions concern social scientists more widely. And of course, they're not only important right, for European specialists such as myself, right, but for Australians as well. You know, there's a lot of factors which concern all Western societies. Right? Uh, but at the same time, there is something that is specifically European. Right? And that's what is hard to actually define and what I, with my colleague in that research project, have been trying to do. Right? So the particular influence of jihadism in this video, I think it is safe to now to say is linked to a, the, an incredibly complex interaction of different factors that are specific to Europe. Some of those uh, factors are to do with things happening outside Europe. Some of those factors are to do with things happening within Europe. Some are social, some are socioeconomic, some are political, some are geopolitical, some are ideological. You can see how complex it is. I'm going to try and provide a simplified narrative yeah, of it. Now, I have to single one major faith factor that is not so well understood. Al Qaeda agents from outside Europe were able to capitalize on a specific European problem of the feelings of socio cultural alienation of a fair proportion of Muslims living in Europe. Right? And this is linked to the specific profile of immigration, Muslim immigration into Europe. Uh, they link to a totally different profile of the majority of Muslims living in Europe from that, for example, of in Muslim immigrants into the United States, right? which is why the jihadist ideology hit the United States but never took hold within right, the United States. Right? So I wish I had the time to also bring in Australian account. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the comparison of Europe and United States because we know so much about them. Uh, as opposed to the United States, immigrants, Muslim immigrants to Europe were in fact working class, right? Starting very early, right? Late 50s, early 60s, they, were, they came in to, to help the industrialization of Europe uh, in the 60s. And with some exceptions, they have by and large remained working class. They've not succeeded in joining the middle class in sufficient numbers the Americans, because of the selective immigration problems, have Muslims that are you know, coming with PhDs, coming with staff for research labs. But they belong up to a middle class, and they enter the American middle class. That's not the case in Europe. And because of their working class profile, Muslims living in Europe, some of them who are the offsprings right, of migrants, and therefore are citizens of France, Germany, Belgium, Denmark, Italy, and so on, uh, had little form of religious education, making them vulnerable to the teaching of fundamentalists claiming to be representing the real Islam, especially as often their parents gave up Islam when they first settled in Europe for reasons which I'll just touch on. So Muslims, in other words, in Europe, are a subsection of the most vulnerable part of the population, that part which has been most affected by the economic change associated with globalization and European economic integration. And that is important. 
and their socioeconomic marginalization they suffer greater rates of, of, of unemployment and associated with that also represent a high proportion of criminality in many European countries has encouraged their cultural marginalization, marginalization. and this we answer the really difficult question right? uh, this to a large extent but not exclusively because I do not want also to dismiss you know, the individual motivations which will lead to the radicalization, radicalization of some people and not others. And this is why the case of the French terrorist Mary is so interesting. He's, he became radicalized, his brother did not. Right? So it's extremely complex. But this to a large extent explains the return of Muslim piety which then could in some cases well, also motivate violent radicalization. Right? Muslim piety, you know, uh, yes, means following all those traditions associated with Muslim faith, uh, faith, um, Friday afternoon prayers, uh, wearing of uh, female headscarves for females. I'm sure you've heard all the talk about the book out in Europe about all this. Uh, all this has been happening in Europe. There's been a very strong revival of Muslim piety, right? The problem is that this phenomenon, which has led to the visibility of Islam right, in European society, runs totally counter to the strong secularization of European societies. Right? By and large, European societies are the most secularized, the least interested in religion right, within the Western world. And, it's strong, and this is not just France. If you look at figures for Sweden, it's the same thing. Right? Um, the strong European secular mindset uh, has fostered misunderstanding right, of this revival of the Muslim party and the tendency right, to confuse it with jihadism. Right? So that people who want to uh, worship right, according to traditional norms and sometimes fundamentalist norms, then they are terrorists. Right? They're just brought into terrorist So this confusion has been very, very uh, influential. And this leads me back to De Vilpin is in statement about neoconservative, American neoconservative influences over Europe. Paradoxically, the American neoconservative discourse of civilization of conflict in fact exercised great influence over Europe. What do I say paradoxically? Because American neoconservatism is in fact more associated with a strong religious position, right? which is uh, Christian. Right? although it also has a Jewish dimension because of the specificity of what is called the American civil religion, which I can't go into, right? Uh, but that discourse of civilizational war, right, civilizational conflict, uh, brought itself on the European fears, which were older, because they started in the 80s, associated with immigration. And in particular, it encouraged something which I will call the myth of Islamization because I do not think that there are the figures and the facts to support it. Right? So this is my position. Right? Uh, which was first fed off by the extreme right neo-nationalist, by extreme right neo-nationalist parties in France, in the Netherlands, you may have heard of Gerd Wilders, right? Um, it's, right? But France having the biggest Muslim population, being a big country, you know, this is the one that's most visible, but it's been happening, you know, the past few years in Italy as well, right? Uh, and to give you an example of what it is, yes, I'm wrapping up now, so we've got three slides, right? Uh, there's a very, uh, there's a book which is called Revolution Europe and Europe be the same with different people in it, which was published in 2009, which was written by Christopher Colbert, who's a journalist with neoconservative affiliations, right? That has, in fact, strengthened this myth of the Islamization of Europe. But it's been greatly criticized by assumptions it made about the nature of demographic change in Europe and the nature of its cultural impact. Right? And I think it has been demonstrated that this has been fueling what can be called anti-Islamic activism in Europe, or in short hand, Islamophobia. Right? And Islamophobia has demonstrated its own destructive potential through the attacks by the normal religion terrorists and the spreadicts. Right? So I have actually given you, wait, you see it at the bottom, right, there's a picture. But this is the book that introduced the notion of Islamophobia, right? And it was associated with the creation of a British parliamentary commission, right? To investigate what was happening in Europe, right? With respect to hostility, anti-Islamic activism, or Islamophobia. And I shall not wrap it up.
For Islamophobia has become very active in continental Europe, especially in Western Europe, as part of something which political theorists analyze as the politics of fear. The politics of fear have been evident for quite some time, for other words, in Australia, remember, Pempa, remember, refugees, okay? It's not just Europe. But they seem to have assumed an exacerbated form in recent years. And politics of fear have been analyzed by American and European academics um, as a, a kind of strategy of uh, responsibility avoidance by political elites. They use, you know, academics like to use complicated notions. They use the notion of illegal government. I'm not going to go into that. Right? Uh, now, these politics of fear make uh, those affected by problems which government can't or won't solve. Uh, so that's an interesting you know, point that I can't develop. Uh, responsible for their own plight. Right? So you're familiar with the unemployed, responsible for their own employment, the single mothers who are responsible, I'm not going to wade into that big debate, right? But you know how it's been part of, of the way political problems are discussed today in Western society. And it presents all those problems which politicians can't, because I think some they can't, or won't, because I think some it's because they won't, right? uh, as personal and individual, on the one hand, or as national, natural, sorry, religious, cultural, on the other. And that's you know, where Islamophobia comes in and mixes all those things together. It can be argued that this is how Islamophobia is now being used by many European political figures to divert attention from the failures of government. Right? If you're interested in what those failures might be. And these failures, I believe strongly, and that's also part of what one of the research projects I'm involved with, my own research is, have been exposed by the financial crisis. And I think that European Muslims have been caught up in a much bigger problem, which affects European societies as a whole. And this is a crisis of democratic legitimacy um, associated with the way the economic crisis is being handled in Europe today. Uh, and that crisis of democratic legitimacy plays out at both the national and the European level and involves all these complexities of how national governments have been using the European Union right, to blame things when they fail or to push things that they didn't have the courage to push, right? It's extraordinarily complex. Um, but obviously that was not my topic, so um, I have just provided some general references that if you want the, the PowerPoint most, you will be able to look up. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I've covered a bit of ground here and that's always time. Thank you. Thank you.